Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Brittany Barco, and I'm the Senior Director of Development for Rutgers Biomedical Health Sciences. Thank you for being with us tonight. This webinar is part of the Rutgers University Alumni Association's virtual event series, which offers Rutgers alumni and friends the opportunity to stay connected and hear from faculty members across the university. Please note, all attendees have been placed on mute for the duration of this discussion. If you have questions, please send them via the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. There will be a Q&A following the discussion. We will get to as many questions as possible. Today, we are honored to have with us Dr. Colleen Donovan and Les Barda. Dr. Donovan is an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine and Simulation Director at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. She received her training from Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. Les Barda is the Director of Simulation at the Ernest Mario School of Pharmacy at Rutgers University in New Jersey. He is responsible for the technology-based clinical simulations for the pharmacy school and fosters the development of interprofessional simulation opportunities with other Rutgers Biomedical Health Sciences units and the academic health system. During the COVID-19 pandemic, he collaborated on innovating tele-simulations and oversaw the vaccine point of dispensing at the school, providing experiential learning to multiple healthcare learner disciplines, giving them nearly 20,000 vaccines to the Rutgers community. Currently, he is a doctoral student in the Rutgers Graduate School of Education, concentrating on the design of simulation as a learning environment to afford professional identity development in healthcare. He began, his emergency, he began in the emergency services field in 1992 and continues to practice as a paramedic today. Les has experience as a career firefighter, emergency service lieutenant, an educator for both fire EMS programs as an instructor and program director. Finally, in the community, he holds elected office as a fire commissioner for the past 13 years. As chairperson of the board, he is responsible for overseeing a 33 person department with approximately 7 million budget. It is now my privilege to turn it over to Colleen and Les. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Hello, hello. <laughs> um, uh, just like Brittany said, my name is Colleen Donovan. I'm an emergency medicine doc uh, and simulation director, and Les is my partner in crime. Absolutely. We've been together since uh, well before even the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, but we have a long history of trying to innovate and come together. So we're proud to present tonight some of the work that has gone on in the past two years and some of the advancements and where we hope to see the future go in our simulation for healthcare. So we're going to show you a little bit about how we've been using simulation, specifically tele-simulation. So when we have our learners who are not physically present in the room with us, um, what we're going to do is show you a little bit of the behind the scenes stuff that we do, but also walk you through one of the scenarios that we do with our um, more senior students. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to share my screen with you guys so you can see what it looks like. Well, Colleen's taking care of that and she's going to share our screen here. You're going to see a bunch of different views. You're going to see views that we use from the cameras that are basically built into our simulation uh, room here at the Ernest Mayer School of Pharmacy. And we're located in Piscataway on the Bush campus of Rutgers. Uh, we're also going to have some portable views you'll see later on from some of the technology, but everything that has been in here and we are going to show you today, we have sort of uh, innovated or necessitated innovation during the pandemic to switch to a remote learning environment. One of the challenges we had during COVID was we were not allowed to have the students here physically, so we had to figure out how to do that remotely. So... This is going to be an interactive experience. You can't see me right now because I've stepped up your screen, but here I am. Um, you're going to see, just like Les said, a couple of different uh, views. And the easiest way to see everything here is to kind of have it in the side-by-side -side view where you kind of have your presentation on one side and you have us as the speaker, if that's possible, on one side. You can slide that bar back and forth and that will help give you the best view for things. Um, so stay curious, friends. If you have questions as we go throughout this process, please drop them in the chat or in the QA section. Um, our moderators will help by throwing those questions out as we go along. Um, once again, Les and I are 
homegrown. We are from New Jersey. Um, both of us for a very long time practiced at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in New Brunswick. We have a lot of EMS and simulation history. As far as disclosures are concerned, that's me. That's Les. We got nothing. <laughs> we got no disclosures to show you. We have no commercial interest in any of the equipment or material that you're going to see today. Um, no one has paid us for any endorsements, any of that stuff. It is all the things that we have found in our toolbox here at MSOP uh, that we've been able to use. Yeah, so everything you're going to see today is stuff that we have manipulated or bent to our will. Um, none of these companies pay us anything to use their stuff. So this is an interactive experience, not just a lecture. So in order to move the things forward, we need you to participate. Um, you can talk to us through the chat function or the QA function. Um, the things that you're gonna need to play this game with us are your computer, obviously. Headphones will be very helpful as we're going to be listening to some important sounds today. Chrome is the preferable browser and a QR code reader with your phone um, can be helpful so you can kind of experience things as our students do. Please be patient with us. Sometimes the technology gets a little cranky. <laughs> All right, uh, so as Les was mentioning, one of our trickiest things was going from this view, right? This famous, famous uh, painting by Rembrandt of the anatomy lab, where you had all the students around you in place. We had to go from that in 1632 to this in 2020, where all of the learners were remote. I didn't make this meme, but I think it's hilarious, so I use it all the time. Um, I still love this guy right here. You see this guy? He's got all of this cool tech going on around him and he's still not paying attention. It's just like real life. All right. So this is just a quick overview of some of the things we're gonna talk about today. Um, as you may have seen in the ad for this talk, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what telemedicine and remote medicine might be like in the future. So for the purposes of today's simulation, you guys are going to be the healthcare team on the ground in New Brunswick at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, while Les and I are on Mars. That's the HAB. We're out of here. <laughs> so this is the HAB. This is from the movie The Martian, if you remember, with uh, Matt Damon. And I like to pretend like I'm Matt Damon. This is my PPE for when I was working in the ER during COVID. I look, don't I look just like him? I look just like him. Spit an image. Thank you. I feel famous already. All right. So every good lesson starts with a patient encounter. Um, we learn from each other, but we also learn from our patients. So the patient today is going to be a 50-year-old man who presents to our Martian emergency department with palpitations and trouble breathing. We're going to try to manage him here on Mars, but you guys are going to help guide our decision making from home. Uh, what kind of things would you like to know from our patient? We forgot to introduce our patient. Our patient today will be played by uh, Hal, uh, and he will be playing the role of Robert. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit of a backstage view. Um, this is how we get to get to our students, all right? We, um, we use software like Polev, and I'm going to drop this in the chat for you. While Colleen's dropping that in the chat, one of the things we try to do is create sort of a, uh, an interest or a motivation for the students to engage. Part of this is a little bit of gamification, but also having instant feedback. So she's able to use Poll Everywhere, which is a, a off-the-shelf software on the cloud that allows the students to submit their questions. These simulations we've done for groups as small as six up to groups as large as 165. So you can imagine it's, a, it's very difficult when you're in a Zoom to have 165 hands raised, but this way people can click on this, they can use their device, whether they're on a computer, whether they're on an iPad or a phone itself, um, and it, it really helps it be a little bit more robust. So if you click on the uh, link that she just put into the webinar chat, uh, the other option is you can also join by text. If you have your phone, you're gonna text Colleen Donovan to the number 22333. And that allows you to get into the conversation. Now, one of the things that we did learn during COVID was that we were had to be sort of aware of our internet connections also, right? And sometimes the students may not have had the best connections. So we were trying to meet them where they were. So if you guys can go ahead and pop some questions in 
uh, into this app so we can or into this interface so that we can see what your questions are in real time. That would be great. I'm going to open up so we can see if anybody's put anything. <laughs> so, blah, blah. Thanks. <laughs> And so if anyone is in, in uh, their phone, again, you can text, you can click on that link up there. Uh, but typically at this point, you would see the students start to pop in sort of the initial questions, you know, uh, maybe when did this start or what are the, what are you feeling, those types of things. So uh, again, the students themselves, they would get an orientation to this initially. So I, I do understand if you're a little hesitant on it right now, but usually we would start to see things pop up fairly quickly. The more times someone asks something, it, the larger the message is going to get. So there's a question, when did the symptoms start, for example? Um, so yeah, Doc, they've been bothering me for about an hour now. I feel like I can't catch my breath. Right. And then so someone wants to say, what is the pulse in VP? So we'll we'll get some vital signs. I'm going to go cycle of breath pressure right now. And I can show you back here on our leave this leave this screen open on wherever you're working on it because we'll come back to it. But here's an example of what this stuff looks <laughs> of what this stuff looks like. Um, what are you using any medications, Robert? No, I had I don't take any medicines. I haven't taken anything for a long time. Um, my typical diet? Well, you know, I'm not such a good uh, it's not such a good diet here on Mars. Really, we only have potatoes. So I eat a lot of potatoes. Um, yes. <laughs> um, do I have a family history of heart problems? I'm not really sure, Doc, but I think my dad had a heart attack when he was a little bit older than I am now. Um, is my left arm hurting? No, my left arm doesn't hurt, but my heart feels like it's beating really fast. And when did this start? It started about an hour ago. It's been super uncomfortable. So you can kind of see how we go back and forth with some of these, um, with some of these questions. Um, that brings us up to the vital signs. Um, and if you look over here on our learning space monitor, you can see the vital signs are kind of populated down here. Let me see if I can fix that so you guys can see it better. Yeah. There we go. Now, so now you can see these are the vital signs that are going on in the room right now. I can actually change these. So let's say that our patient, Robert, who's complaining of these heart palpitations, let's say his vital signs actually look like this. And so these vital signs are generated by our mannequin system that creates uh, vitals, but also allows us to change on the fly based on the treatment that the team decides or, or makes a decision, or our patient can deteriorate as we go through the scenario. Mm -hmm. This is allowing them to basically do team-based learning where they start to look for all the details and then start to form a differential diagnosis as to what's going on. Um, additionally, when we do this for our students, this is usually a smaller group. So it's not a webinar, it's actually just a Zoom meeting. So they can physically speak to us at the same time if they want to. Um, so now you can see that the vital signs have changed. The person who asked for the heart rate and the blood pressure, our heart rate is 124, our blood pressure is 120 over 83. Um, and we usually wanna go into additional, um, additional physical exam findings. So let's move this one over here. Um, so for that, um, and again, if you guys can see me on my main screen or my main presentation, um, separate from the, the PowerPoint, I have this very special stethoscope. It's a digital stethoscope it's from a company called Echo. And what this allows me to do is both record heart sounds and lung sounds, uh, but it also allows me to, um, to live stream sounds. So I can use this stethoscope at the bedside and have everybody kind of log in on their phone with their earbuds so they can hear what's happening with a real live patient. Or for our scenarios, I can switch us over to my dashboard and we can hear some sounds. So this is the time that you wanna go ahead and put your headphones on. Make sure that your volume is turned up a decent amount because all of these sounds, because they are heart and lung sounds, are low pitched. That's why you need the earbuds to go in your ears when you're listening on a stethoscope. Um, this actually does simulate what it's like to listen to someone's heart. So here we go. Alrighty, so my first question is, and we'll go back to that pole lever really quickly. Uh, could you hear it? <laughs> and you could just type yes. 
or drop it in the chat. There you go. Thank you, Sheila. Yes. Okay, good. I hope hopefully. <laughs> Thank you, Foundation. Uh, good. So that's what a normal heartbeat sounds like when we're listening to anybody's heart. What our patient has today actually sounds like this. So friends and colleagues who are online and in the webinar chat, do those two things sound the same? You can keep it simple, yes or no. You're right, Sheila, it is not the same. <laughs> um, Tracy, let's see. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Audible again, but distinctly different. Good, good, so we've identified that this is not normal. In fact, it's quite a bit faster, right? And one of the things that we like to try to figure out is, you know, is this regular? We'll listen to it one more time. Does this, or can you predict when the next beat is gonna happen? Very good, Sheila. Sheila, you're like, I've done it, I like this. Come hang out with me. Straight to you too. Very good. Very good. So that's correct, right? This is <laughs> yay, Sheila. Um, <laughs> yay, Carol. Um, right. You can't predict that next beat. And Paul Weber is my ringer, right? That's irregularly irregular. So that means this is a fast, irregularly irregular rhythm. This is probably a very specific rhythm. Paul, you know what it is, right? What is it? Paul, if you can drop what the rhythm is in the chat. Thank you. AFib. So this is atrial fibrillation. Those are some classic findings that you can figure out just by listening to a patient. Now, of course, you would order an EKG to kind of confirm this, but you can tell just by listening um, that this patient is probably an AFib. Okay. Um, and just to kind of round out our auscultation, let's make sure we listen to the lungs. Now you can imagine we're doing telesimulation. Our students are not here. They're actually on a big screen during COVID. We were in this room with our PPE on, did socially distancing, testing ourselves. And then the students were remote in their homes and wherever they were. And so part of it was how do you transmit this information? And, and luckily Colleen had some technology available, but this stethoscope actually has now lent itself even for making disability accommodations. It's able to uh, amplify sounds about 40 times. So even our students that need hearing assistance actually is something we found works very well. So again, the innovation of, of one thing leads to a solution to another problem. And to Les's point about PPE, when I use a stethoscope like this, I can just, because it's streaming, I can stream it to my phone and directly to my earbuds. When I've got that full headset on and my full mask on, it's extremely difficult to get the earpieces into my ears. If I just have my earbuds in, I can hear the heart and lung sounds without ever having to put this anywhere near my face. So yay tech. Um, and just really quickly, here's what the lungs sound like. So I had to turn that up really loud so that everybody can hear it across distance, but that's essentially what normal lungs sound like when you're listening with our stethoscope. So, so far we've got a couple of things that we know are wrong. We know that the heart rate is fast, um, and that the, um, we're probably in AFib because we're irregularly irregular, right? <laughs> Good morning. A whole bunch of caffeine can do this to you. Um, so now we get to start to talk a little bit about why this is happening. Why did this person all of a sudden go into atrial fibrillation? I mean, he was well enough to travel to Mars. How the heck did he all of a sudden start going into this abnormal rhythm? It's a, it's a question for the ages. Um, yep, and as we, we go through the scenario itself, you'll see these cues are put into the scenario. So as they progress through the case or through the team-based learning part, they're going to be sort of given little pieces as they go through. Um, things like dynamic vital signs sometimes, 
will be an indicator that things have changed. And we will wait for certain answers back from the team, and then that will be our part to move on to the next uh, segment. Now, I don't know about you, Les, but something, something's not looking right here. Yeah, I think so. Do you see that? Hey, Robert, you feel okay? Oh, Doc, I feel really dizzy. I think his, his heart rate went up. Let me check his blood pressure again. Hold on. So at this point in our simulations, a good chunk of the time, we kind of put a little pause in. We ask our students to think about what could be causing these different types of things. We do normally go back to the poll F screen here and ask them to put in additional information, any type of responses. I'm not going to ask you guys to do that today, but I can show you some examples of ones that we've done in the past. So here's one where they we ask them to put in their top five differentials, what they think might be causing the problem, uh, but we come up with a word cloud. Now, if you're familiar with word clouds, the more frequently someone enters a term or a word into the, the computer program, the larger it appears and the brighter color it appears on the word cloud. So the one that you see here is one that we did for someone who was in respiratory distress. So you could see a lot of people were thinking about COVID and pneumonia. Someone was thinking about PE or pulmonary embolism, influenza, infection, and then lesser things that people were thinking about were things like Lyme disease, whooping cough, pasteurella. Um, for another infection one that we did, we asked what we, what sort of tests we wanted to order. Um, almost everybody wanted to order blood cultures, uh, CBC, they wanted chemistry panels, urine, and, and even some lesser things like a strep antigen and stuff like that. So this kind of helped us gauge what their understanding was of what they thought might be going on. It also allows us to scaffold based on what the learners are doing and where they are we can actually start to sort of drive them towards uh, a specific part in it. Uh-oh, something's wrong, right? We already said that poor, poor Robert is really not feeling good. So let's take another look. His blood pressure really dropped. That's not good. So we're going to switch views a little bit so that you can see, I'm gonna stop sharing from my main computer and I'm going to, we're gonna share from, yep. from there. Can you pull that one up, us? Because we're actually gonna need some help from you guys. So, when we have an unstable patient like this, right? So now you can kind of see that Robert's, let me come, let me pull this off. Robert's heart rate has gone up quite a bit. So his heart rate is in like the 170s. And his blood pressure, which is the number that's in red, is 67 over 51. Um, we start to get very anxious when the blood pressure drops like that because we're worried about shock states. So shock is, and I would normally have my students define this for me. I would say, okay, guys, what is a shock state? What does that mean to you? Um, and we would walk through the process as to the definition of shock, which is which means hypoperfusion, so not enough blood flow to deliver oxygen uh, to some of the most critical organs in our body. Those are called end organ because they are at the end of a vascular tree or at the end of a certain set of blood vessels. They don't usually have a lot of backup blood flow. Um, and those organs are the brain, the heart, the kidneys, and the eyes. Um, can you guys think of one way that somebody who's unstable like this might show up or what thing they might be complaining of um, if they were feeling super, uh, if they were super tachycardic and hypotensive, you can drop it in the chat. Sheila, you can come play with me anytime. Yeah, they usually, they feel really lightheaded. They feel dizzy. They feel confused. These are all signs that the brain is not being perfused enough. It's not getting enough oxygen. So we don't usually like to mess with that. I'm doing less. I just need to upgrade the uh, upgrade too. Gotcha. Post. So, um, so there's a couple of different things that we can do to help take care of poor 
So there's a couple of things that we can do to take care of poor Robert. Um, one of the main ones is thinking about uh, delivering an electrical therapy. Um, so you may have seen, uh, actually very recently, you may have seen on television um, during the football game when the football player collapsed, right, he had something called commotio cortis, where he got hit in the chest very hard. Um, that caused him to go into an irregular heart rhythm and made him collapse. So just like Sheila and Paul were saying, he got real dizzy and lightheaded. You saw him get up and take a couple of steps and then he went down to the ground, right? His heart was not beating effectively. He wasn't moving blood to his brain. So his body was like, we're gonna lie down now. We can't pump against gravity. We need to go, we need to go horizontal. Um, that's one of the most common causes of people losing consciousness is that they have an irregular heart rhythm. Um, in order to restore the heart rhythm, you have to give you have to like give them another jolt of electricity. You have to get their um, electrical system back online. Um, what we'd like to do is we'd like to show you how to do that. I think we're just having an issue with one of the computers. If I could just ask either Heather or Brittany, can you please just update uh, vital signs to a panelist, please, so we can join in. Oh, there it is. Got it. Thank you. So, Sheila, that's a great question. What about drugs for intervention? Now, a good chunk of the time, if the patient is stable, we might be able to give them some medication. So back when Robert's heart rate was like 120 or 140, when his blood pressure was OK, we probably could give him some medications to help slow that heart rate down and, and make him feel better. Um, but at this point, where his heart rate is so fast and his blood pressure is so low, we can tell that he's not his heart isn't filling appropriately. And bef it, before we can get the drugs drawn up and actually injected into him, he might actually go into cardiac arrest. Um, so what we have right now is called unstable AFib or unstable atrial fibrillation. And there's a very, very specific thing that we have to do to take care of this. Does anybody know what it's called? You can see my lovely monitor now. I'm watching the chat and I see cardioversion. Uh, how about a relaxation technique? So at this point, so that is, Cynthia, that is a great point. Once again, when the patient is um, like awake and not having any of these scary symptoms. Like if they're just feeling the palpitations and maybe a little bit of windedness, we can get them to take some deep breaths and things like that. At this point, he needs electricity. So it's not a technically a defibrillation, it's a cardio version. And this is the part where I need somebody to help me. Um, who, who would like to be my volunteer? <laughs> I might call on you because that's what I do in real class. <laughs> it's usually like a game of chicken. We see him blinks first. No, no, Colleen actually is a good way of getting them to tease it out. And it's also part of their own sort of leadership development as they go through this. So we'll take anyone from the audience. Uh, if the question I'm going to have is for Brittany or Heather. Please elevate, actually. Oh, Carol, you're Carol's on the spot, here. Carol. All right, Carol, I'm going to need your help to take care of poor Robert here because he's feeling super duper sick. So what I need you to do is you should see at the top of your screen, um, there's a green bar that says you are viewing vital signs monitor screen. Um, right next to that, it says view options. What I'd like you to do is click on view options and then choose request remote control. You may have to elevate her to a panelist also. Ah, yes. Let me see that. Uh, Heather or Brittany, we may have to elevate uh, Carol to a panelist also just to see if she has access to that. So normally in our room, we are the panel. We are the, the host of the entire meeting. So this uh, with the students, we actually will end up giving them control the moment they come in. So I think she's just been joined. So if she climbs to the top of the screen, the middle of the screen where it says view options with your mouse, um, and you can request control, and it should automatically let you take control of my mouse here. And so we'll know that if you start to move around the room or move around the screen. And Carol, you can come off mute. We'll be able to hear you now. Carol, can you come off mute for us? I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through it, but I got to be able to talk to you. It's sort of like diffusing a bomb <laughs> online. 
Um, so part of this is also allowing our students to experience sort of the steps in actually performing this procedure safely. Although they're not here physically pushing the button, the, the knowledge, the skills are still the same. And then the psychomotor is very easy to teach someone afterwards. And Carol is going to help me. I don't think, Carol, have you ever cardioverted anyone before? No? Okay, today's the first day. Yay. Okay. So, Carol, at the top of your screen, you should see a green bar that says you are viewing the vital signs screen. If you move your mouse all the way to the top of the screen. You, it says you can control vital monitor screen. Is that what you mean? That's, yep, that's, that's what we want you to do. Okay. Um, but it just says view options for that. Yep, yep, so click view options, come on down. It's like the fourth or fifth option down, I believe. Request control. It no, just says give up remote control. Oh, so you already have that it. That means you have it, okay. All right, so click with your mouse on my screen. So click, click on this vital signs monitor and you should be able to move your mouse around. It says that installation failed, I don't know. So these are, again, these are some of the technical issues that we have with even students, depending on the devices that they're on and what they're doing. So sometimes we have to adapt to that. So we can go through it still. Mm -hmm. um, and just basically what would end up happening is our student then has to sort of verbalize through it. And we'll do it manually here because we're still watching the same thing. So I would ask, um, okay, well, since we have a connection issue, what, what do I do? What button do I push to do this safely? Right, so the next step would be, so for example, I'm actually joined in this with my confidence monitor. So I am joined in with a completely different computer. And so Carol, you can rel relinquish remote control and I will request it. Um, no, it says I can request it. It can't say I can relinquish it. I, we, <laughs> we dropped it off and now I think Colleen has control. Right, so, so now I can move my mouse all around this screen and what you'll see where there's where it says jewels. Should be able to drop the jewels. Yeah. So, so now she's actually manipulating that button on that screen here in our sim lab, which is representing Mars, but she is remote to could be two miles away, could be thousands of miles away around the world. Um, and one of the innovations that this comes to is thinking of global sort of health uh, outcomes. How can we help teach someone in Africa? How can we help teach someone in a completely different continent by using simulation? They may not have the, uh, the technology there present. They may not have a mannequin, but we can still go through the scenario and let them go through the decision process and manipulate our virtual monitor here uh, at Rutgers. And actually, let me try this with one of our other panelists. Um, who, which one of you wasn't here? For our, for our demo, I remember somebody said that they weren't here. Brittany, was it you? I can certainly join if you'd like me to. All right, Brittany, you're on the spot. Sorry, Carol, I'm not sure what the what the issue was, but you're oh, thank on you. You're on backup. <laughs> so, Brittany, let's try that again one more time. You see where it says uh, for view options? I got it. Request remote control. <laughs> Go for All right. it. All right. I'm okay, now the first thing I want you to do is I want you to, as long as it seems to work, you should be able to move your mouse around. Do you see um, my mouse? Good. I was bored. Do you see the button where the button says sync? It looks like a two arrows in a circle with a line through it. Go yep. ahead and click that button. You are controlling the monitor. I hit. There it is. And now so you should see her mouse moving around. And yep. you saw sync turn green, right? So now we see little white dots on all of the QRS complexes. So those big spikes have a little white dot on it. What that means is that the, the monitor, the cardioversion or defibrillation monitor is marking where the heart is experiencing a big kick of electricity. Because what we are about to do to Robert is give him a really big kick of electricity. Cardioversion is essentially the control alt delete for the heart, you give such a big jolt that you depolarize all of your cells at the same time. So all of the cells fire at the same time with the hopes that the normal pacemaker will come back online. Now, if you were able, if you were to give this volume or this amount of energy when the heart was not expecting to get it, 
you would probably put this person into a more unstable rhythm and in fact, put them into cardiac arrest. So we don't want to do that. <laughs> we want to make sure that we hit that sync button. Um, and at this point in the, in the lesson, I would usually make sure that all of the students understand that. I would say, do you, does that make sense to everybody? Right. Okay, cool. Now. One thing we do, Jim, we, we do pads too. So we also need to make sure that the pads are on. So. so part of that is also kind of going through the demonstration for the students of what has to happen to be able to do this. So he's on a monitor, but how do we deliver that energy? And so one of the things that we do have to make sure that they understand is that there's actually parts that need to be done. So one is basically opening up pads and placing pads on our mannequin. So sometimes during the scenarios, we'll actually have the students explain these procedures while we're doing it. So we are essentially their, their hands, but they are still talking to the mannequin. So we would expect someone on the monitor to be explaining, hey, Robert, we're going to put some pads on you. Uh, you're going to feel these are going to be a little bit cold. They're going to go on your chest. And on the side here. And these pads are the same type of pads, the same idea that you would see uh, just recently in the news with Damara Hamlin and his on field cardiac arrest. These are the same pads that would be placed with an AED or in the defibrillator inside the hospital. So, again, thinking of real terms of, of how this happens, that team did that on the field in front of 50,000 attendees and millions of people watching online. They're doing this procedure on someone who is having CPR done to them. No pressure, Brittany, just saying. There's not like 5 million people watching, it's just 19, so it's all good. <laughs> the other nice thing is that, pro tip, you can't hurt the plastic patient. That's well, enough. It's enough. <laughs> all right, so good. We've got our, our monitor set up, we've got our pads on, we know that we're synced in, on the monitor. The next thing is going to be to, because <laughs> I love Sheila, go, <laughs> um, um, I want you to set the energy, okay? So I want you to drop the energy down to uh, 180. Good, all right. So now, normally, in order to cardiovert atrial fibrillation, we need somewhere between 150 and 200 joules. So we're going to start with 180 for Robert. Uh, the, the next step is to explain to Robert what's going on, right? So normally we would have our students explain this, but you know, I'll do this part. Like, Robert, your heart is going extremely fast and it's really dangerous. The only way that we can fix this for you right now is to be, give you a large shock of electricity. It's going to hurt, but it's going to be very fast. Most of the time, the response I get to that in my real patients is like, okay, doc, do whatever you got to do. Um, if, if we have the time to get it, we don't think that the patient is going to go into cardiac arrest. We will give them medication to sedate them and medication for pain. Um, if it's a real life emergency, if it's a real time emergency, like it is right now, we don't do that. We just go right for the shock. So Brittany, you're up. Go ahead and hit that charge button. So when you deliver that shock, that's a painful shock to them. But really, we also try to enforce the, the sort of safety parts to it. So delivering electricity, we want to make sure the bed is clear. I'm clear. You're clear. We're all clear. And then we reinforce that with our students every time. So we won't hold you uh, responsible for that one. That's okay. But we do make sure that the students are sort of engaged in that conversation about what are the things that you need to do when you're going through something like this. Holy crap, Doc, that really hurt. But my chest feels better now. <laughs> Let's cycle the blood pressure, see if that got any better after that. Yeah, so you guys can see on the monitor now, right? The heart rate is much better. It's down to 76. And cycle the blood pressure now to see if the blood pressure is any better. Uh, but cardioversion is like a light switch. It works, which it does most of the time. Um, once you reset that pacemaker, the heart starts beating on its own. Yay, Paul! The heart rate is 75 to 76 in regular. Brittany, you did it! <laughs> well done. <laughs> and the blood pressure is perfect. It's 119 over 79. Now, just like Les was talking about before, Brittany, where are you right now? Like physically, where are you? I am at home in my home office. And home in, in East Brunswick, New Jersey. So you're in East Brunswick. We're in New we're in the Piscataway, rather. So we're several miles apart, and you were able to do that. 
the farthest that I have done this with a student, we did this whole thing. And I asked the student, just like I asked Brittany, it's like, where are you right now? He's like, I'm in Ghana. <laughs> oh. So he was able to do this same scenario, this same cardio version from like almost the other side of the world. <laughs> um, cool. All right. So um, Les, if you can stop sharing there, I'm going to yep. start sharing here. So good job team, but we're not quite done yet. We still got to figure out what's going on here, right? We know that there was some dangerous stuff. We started, we took care of the acute life threat, but we're not quite out of the woods, right? We went from, uh-oh, to, oh, thank goodness. If you guys don't know the awkward Yeti, I highly recommend it. They are very funny cartoons. Um, so we would move on to things like orders. And I would bring up a screen that looks kind of like this. Um, they would ask me for certain things like an EKG. Here's what, here's what Robert's EKG would have looked like before. Um, this is a pretty classic looking uh, AFib. Um, I would probably go, go for a chest X-ray. This is a very normal looking chest X-ray. Um, and then we move on to something like a CAT scan. And Brittany, I'm going to ask you for help again. Um, if you can go ahead and, whoops. I'm going to have you request control of my screen one more time. All right, I'm going to make this bigger so you guys can see it. All right, so this is a scrollable CAT scan. We have figured out a way to bend PowerPoint to our will. Um, and Brittany, you should be able to click on the image here and then scroll up or down. There you go. So this, we can make it so that the students can, from their home, play the radiologist. They can scroll up and down um, and look at the cross sections through CAT scans or MRIs, x-rays, you name it, we've got it. So uh, Brittany, I'm going to have you scroll down and I'm going to highlight some pretty important structures. So keep going. And during the pandemic, people are doing this from home. Yeah, there's a lot of collaboration that's happening in healthcare from people who are remote. So if you have a small ER in the middle of a rural uh, town somewhere, you don't have a radiologist on staff. There might be a radiologist halfway around the world who's helping you read these scans. And we're basically using the same uh, concepts here too. Except that this is embedded in PowerPoint so instead, in PowerPoint. Of, instead right. of an actual... Um, Radiologist. Radiology like program. So keep scrolling down. What you'll see is this big white band in the middle of the chest there. That's the arch of the aorta. Keep coming down. Very good. And right under that, if you keep going down, so there we see the branch of the, of the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary arteries, those come off the right side of the heart. Keep coming, Brittany, there's something nasty there. Oh, go back up a little. There you go, okay. So does anybody know what this is? It's okay if you don't, I'm gonna go over it because I have some more toys to share with you. And you can drop that in the chat if you know what it is. If you don't, we will help you. Let's see, I think Paul Weber probably knows what that is. Paul, what is that thing? Unless we lost Paul. <laughs> All right, well, I'm just gonna guide really quickly. Um, you should be able to see my mouse too. So this is the pulmonary trunk here, right? Um, let me get my annotations. So here's the pulmonary trunk. Right, you should see me outlining it in red. So that's where the pulmonary arteries come out of the right side of the heart and lead toward the lungs where we do gas exchange, where you get oxygen coming in from the lungs and carbon dioxide going out from the blood vessels. There's a really big blockage right here. When we put contrast into the CAT scan, it shows up bright white in the blood vessels. There you go, Paul, it's a, it's a pulmonary embolism. So this patient has a huge, what we call saddle embolus. Um, and if I'm gonna borrow it back from you for a sec, Brittany. If I scroll a little bit more, you can see that this big dark area 
takes up both sides. So that is blocking flow to the lungs and pretty much little to no oxygen is getting picked up. Um, this is a very specific type of shock called obstructive shock because there's this big obstruction here causing the problem. So now this can be kind of hard as you probably can tell, this image can be a little bit hard to interpret if you haven't looked at a lot of them. Um, so we've got some other fun things that I can share with you. Um, Les, why don't you describe what I'm about to do? Sure. It's set up. So while Colleen's getting the next item set up, um, this is actually, again, an innovation that came out of sort of the, the necessity to be able to demonstrate anatomy and the sort of relationship of where these problems lie in relationship to the anatomy. So working together, one of the things uh, we were able to secure is a, a whole lens. Uh, Colleen was able to get one and basically crack it using the developer toolkit so that we can use it to broadcast through Zoom and she's going to use augmented reality. A lot of people talk about augmented reality, artificial intelligence, extended reality, AI, and virtual reality or VR. These are all relatively related areas, but each one has its own modality. And we are using different parts for different things. So in this case, we are augmenting reality, which means we are here present, but we're going to show you something that doesn't exist. And so as Colleen moves around, her anatomy uh, analog here that's going to show you vessels and structures is part of that augmented reality. So what we're looking at here, so step number one, can you guys see it? Yes. <laughs> can you guys see the uh, the anatomy hologram that's in front of me here? Thanks. Thanks, Sheila. Thanks, Paul. All right. So you can see here, like right in the front, uh, it says heart, right? So if I move forwards towards the heart, the heart will actually, the muscle will get out of my way. Right? So I can look right into the heart. So I can see if I come around the side, I can see the right atrium up here. And I can see the valve, the tricuspid valve. That the, so the blood would come in from the veins back here, go into the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, and into the right ventricle. Now, from the right ventricle, we kind of go up into the pulmonary trunk, which is this big blue vessel. And you can kind of see, let's connect still. Yeah. You can see the red arch of the aorta that has all the big blood vessels coming off the top. And you can see the pulmonary trunk here where it branches. Now I'm gonna look down and you'll see where it had that split. All right, does everybody see that? Is that a yes, Leslie? Yep. Okay, cool. So you can see where that branch happens. Now that clot was sitting like right in this space. Yeah, can you point to it? Let's see if I can get to it. The challenge is when we're in multiple places here, but yeah, right in this area. Yeah, so <laughs> it's spanning that that blue, area. that blue thing. So the where the blood vessels start to go out to the rest of the lungs, blood, no blood is getting past that obstruction. So what happens, so there's no blood getting to the lungs to pick up oxygen or drop off carbon dioxide. And once again, as we kind of back out, right, and we back down. So the, if we follow the course of the blood, right, the blood can't move forwards. So it's gonna start to push back into the right ventricle. The right ventricle is going to stretch and dilate because there's so much blood that's accumulating there that is going to disrupt the electrical pathways because up at the top where your, where your atrium is, that's where that pacemaker is, that SA node, the pacemaker for the heart. So as that right side of the heart experiences all of this stress, it disrupts the electricity. And that's why this patient with a massive PE turned out to have AFib, atrial fibrillation, that caused palpitations, right? Because his heart had to beat faster and shortness of breath because he wasn't getting enough oxygen. And that's how you build a dresser from Ikea, my friends. <laughs> and, and so as it, I love that statement all the time. We close that and it's, a, it's an aha moment for a lot of the students when they see this uh, and they're going through these cases. And so part of the concept is being able to uh, leverage the tools that we have. There's different versions and different views and different software 
Um, this one is actually specifically by Case Western University, uh, correct? That's right. Um, they, there's different uh, software packages available. And what we're using it for is it basically has a graphical representation, part of the medical illustration for the SIM cases itself, so they understand that. Right, and, so, and this comes with different modules. So right now, obviously, we're focused on the heart and the vasculature. But if I wanted to focus on something else, like, like the GI system, for example, today in anatomy lab, the students were working on the foregut. And a big part of the foregut is the liver which you can see up there, right? That big red thing. And then the gallbladder, which we can see right here, this green thing, right? And when we talk about things like gallstones, gallstones get made in the lumen here, right? And stones, a lot of the times will get stuck in, in the exit part. So like right up at the top there, a stone can get stuck, right? And so, what happens then is that gallbladder gets descended, it gets inflamed, that's called cholecystitis. And when you have an inflamed gallbladder, one of the main ways of treating it before you get septic is to take the gallbladder out. That's called a cholecystectomy. Now you can still live and eat your food <laughs> and digest fatty things because you can see like there's the takeoff, right? Oh gosh, bless, oh, <laughs> can I have this stuff again? Yep. So you can see where the takeoff is, right? If I come up here a little bit, woo, right? That, there's just one part coming from the gallbladder. The rest of these things are coming from the liver. So the liver still connects to this bile duct and we can file, follow the bile duct, the green tube, all the way down to the duodenum. So they're like pretty much the first part of the small intestine. And you can see where it joins the duodenum and that's where all of your bile goes to help to help digest your fatty foods. So this was a really great tool to help the students understand how all of these pieces were connected while they were working in the actual anatomy lab and dissecting things out today. So again, sort of leveraging this, going back to any case, um, the other thing we've managed to do is for procedural things or for coming to a room and maybe reading what the IV pump, what are the medications, we can actually project this as a third person or first person view. Um, you sh you've heard of like first person games. This is basically where the students get to wear our eyeballs and tell me, come, come troubleshoot what is here. So I can come over to an IV setup and see what is uh, being infused. I can see if the blood type is the right blood type. Uh, procedurally, maybe we're, we're watching a chest tube being done and there's something else going on with that where they can witness the hands and emotions and what Colleen is doing in that scenario. And so these are just things that we have figured out during the pandemic on how to adapt simulations that they would be doing here, but to now do them remotely uh, halfway around the world. And uh, JB, to your point, the name of this specific program is called Holo Anatomy. And like Les said, it's from Case Western. Sorry, we're going to have like a little inception moment here while I get this in the And you'll see the room that we're in right now. This is our standard room. This is where actually uh, the School of Pharmacy holds their simulations, uh, along with we co our collaboration with the medical school. Colleen has uh, offered her boot camps for transition to residency for our fourth year med students as they go through. And every time we hold these simulations, we try to encourage interprofessional uh, cooperation. So we get pharmacy students to participate at the bedside for the medical students' uh, uh, options when they do their simulations, along with the physician assistant program, same thing. So as a, as a sort of a, a sandbox where they can experience that interprofessional dialogue and they see each other. Because otherwise, if, if pharmacy is doing their clinical simulations, they are working a team of six to eight pharmacy students and medicine is doing six to eight medicine students, they don't really get those interprofessional dialogues until they get out into residency or they're on clinical rotations. And so this is where we have the chance to do this in our simulation space uh, in a safe environment. And it's really great to see them working together. Um, 
it's amazing how they start to learn to depend upon each other and to trust each other. Um, I always love it when we do the cardiac arrest. We always do a cardiac arrest scenario. Um, and the medical students, they kind of know what to do with respect to the chest compressions and, and the ventilations and things like that, but they're not sure about what to do about the medications. And the pharmacy students are right there. They're right there with the answers. And then when we go into our debrief sessions, we talk about why you would choose one medication or the other other, we don't give them that information. We just ask the questions and the students teach each other, which is very exciting. Um. <laughs> and again, to, to real life examples, think of Damar Hamlin on Monday Night Football when he went down. That was a team, again, like I said before, they had practiced, they had trained, they had simulated that scenario along with the EMS crew and the paramedics that were transporting the ambulance along with the emergency room when he arrived there. Then up in the ICU when he was admitted there, he was ventilated, sedated. There's a, a huge team sport that goes into getting this done and doing it safely and efficiently for our patients. And so the earlier we can do that, the earlier we can let the professions learn where they belong at the top of their scope and work together, the sooner we can get to that sort of uh, improvement in how we perform healthcare. And guys, we're just about to wrap up. I have just a couple more future plans to share with you, um, just so you can see some of our, our, our pictures. I always like to think of this as kind of like, if any of you are Marvel fans and like Iron Man, when Tony Stark has his like, um, his garage where he's like setting up all of his inventions and cars and stuff, I, I want that. <laughs> That's kind of, that is kind of what that HoloLens is like. It is an interactive augmented reality. Um, and you can see this was how I was teaching it um, during COVID. Um, and like Les was talking about, um, we were able to do some procedural Pella simulation stuff. Um, this was practice, this picture is practice doing how to run a code in a room with a patient who has COVID. How do you take care of that person? Um, this one is one of the procedural ones. And what you can see here is I'm wearing the lens and I'm performing the procedure, but the students are guiding me. They can see where my hands are. They're telling me where to go and where to put my, where to put my equipment. Um, a couple of other things that we did during COVID, we, we did a, quite a bit of gamification. Paul Weber knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, we built a, uh, a choose your own adventure game that um, we've made into pre-work for some telesimulations that we do with respect to cardiac arrest. Um, and we're still moving forwards with all of these things. There's always going to be a need for education across distance. There's always going to be a need for new tech, new educational uh, endeavors, things that really push the boundary of how to interact with our students and how to make the content even more palpable or visible right in front of their faces. Yep. So uh, we, Heather or Brittany, I'm sure you're there. We would love to answer any questions. Thank you for the time that everyone's been here. We, we value all your time too. Uh, if you want to stay, we will be here for a few minutes by all means and would love to hear from anyone. So um, again, yeah, Paul, great opportunity to space for us. <laughs> Um, we've had some other collaborations, can't disclose, but yes, um, we, we've worked on some other ideas. So we may, we may or may not have run, helped run a simulation for SpaceX at one point, maybe. Thank you very much, Colleen and Les. That was the coolest thing that I got to do, I think, in a long time from the from the confines of my office at, at in East Brunswick. So I want to be I want to be in your simulation center again, doing it soon. Yeah. I got a lot to learn, you know. Oh, did your did your heart rate go up? Oh, absolutely. I was I was very worried I was going to kill him. So <laughs> we just just a few questions about the simulation center. I think that you guys touched uh, mainly on, you know, things that you've done with the students and the lives and the real life scenarios. And you did mention about the um, the the disciplines and the learners in the simulation. Talk just a little bit more about how they interact and and how they are really um, learning together simultaneously. So, so that is actually kind of the, the cusp of where we are today. Whereas we see coming out of the pandemic, we've realized that there are definitely shifts that need to happen in healthcare and culture. And we also understand that as medicine has evolved, uh, pharmacotherapies have evolved, uh, procedures, equipment, technology, there's a constant stream of things coming out and, and it keeps getting 
broader and broader. And along with that specialization, you've got people who are really experts in their niche or in their area. So when you get to pharmacotherapeutics, I always use the example, FDA approves 40 or 50 drugs a year. Uh, imagine trying to keep it um, just that all in your mind and staying at the edge of, of their practice. Uh, cardiology, every single procedure, there's always innovation coming out. So the more that we can get folks to collaborate, the more that we can get the specialists to work together as opposed to in their individual silos, the better it's going to become. So the simulation collaborative is really sort of a, a cloud that we've uh, envisioned in, in this entire time and it developed through the pandemic and has sort of continued to grow legs as we find synergies across disciplines. And we bring folks together to understand that it makes sense to reach out to your, uh, your colleagues and to reach out and to leverage each other to do this. Uh, again, with technology as it changes, of course, keeping up with it also, this is not a, a small investment. So when we invest in things, we wanna make sure that collaboration is actually used efficiently uh, and all that equipment is actually used efficiently within collaboration. And Les was talking about like return on investment, right? Like when we talk about our more junior learners, there are certain things that they need to learn with their colleagues by themselves. Like the pharmacists have to learn the core of pharmacy. The med students have to learn the core of what it means to be a physician, you know, all of these little pieces. But when it comes to actual practice and actual benefit to a human being, we never do those things in isolation. Those are always practiced as teams. And so it makes sense as our students mature and move on to becoming practicing in their specialty that they practice, especially some of these high risk, low frequency problems. They need to practice these things together with their teammates in order for this to work. That includes like what Les was just saying, when we're getting to the cutting edge of new technology, new equipment in the OR, new medications, let's practice using those things in this safe environment. You can't hurt Robert. <laughs> He'll be fine. We can just reset him. But in order to do that, we've got to have all of the team members at the bedside. Yeah, prior to COVID, the, uh, Colleen and I had already collaborated on some of the what we call inside to or in, uh, in place simulations and working in sort of the intensive care unit in the pediatric side or in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, and so we do some in situ work, which is inside the hospital, typically in clinical spaces. Uh, in the OR, we've been in the operating room, we've been in the trauma based, we have uh, done pediatric trauma readiness, sort of testing the system and processes. So aside from just the formative education that you see here in, in undergraduate medical education, pharmacy, graduate medical education, we also do things that help us out in the field and in the hospital itself, uh, in including how has traveled to the football stadium. He has been used to train athletic trainers here at Rutgers to, to respond to that scenario that you saw the other day. So this, this is where the collaboration comes into play, where pharmacy is helping medicine, medicine helping uh, the next group, PA is coming in, and we continue to work together and we all find sort of the things that make it better one at a time. Yeah, and our big goal is always benefit to our patients. We want our patients to do well, to feel well, and to survive these crazy problems that might happen. And we want our, our providers, our doctors, our nurses, our pharmacists, our PAs, all of the people who make up our medical teams, we want them to be confident in themselves and their abilities. And that's what simulation helps out with. Yeah, it's, it's easy to have someone memorize something, but the communication skills, uh, the non-technical skills are very hard to put into a book. And this is the laboratory where we see that develop uh, in a lot of ways, which really comes down to us being able to research that also and, and see where the pedagogy can go and how we can improve it to make sure that we're doing the best that we can for our learners and then ultimately the patients. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, just looking at the time, I think we can maybe do one more question if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Uh, so this is your simulation center is really cool and i see we see how it can go and really improve and enhance the interprofessional team-based learning approach at Rutgers. with about with over seven thousand students let's say at rbhs how do we offer this opportunity to all of our students and what do we need going forward to keep increasing and improving upon the technology and, and the students and making sure that everybody gets this uh, opportunity. 
Yeah, there really are four in, in the sim collaborative idea. There really are four main ideas that we need to address. A is obviously technology. Equipment uh, obviously has a physical cost to it. Also has a space cost, making sure that we can store it, we can use it, we can accommodate all these learners. Uh, Rutgers is a little unique. We're distributed across the entire state. So we sort of have a geographic challenge that comes into that. So there's regional issues that we want to be able to uh, overcome and that may be having multiple locations that all collaborate together and, and share resources so that we're doing it efficiently. Uh, the other side is faculty, right? We need to develop faculty to learn how to do this and not just to do it okay. We want them to do it excellent. We want them to do it excellent and be able to research that and do it better. So as we can develop faculty, especially incoming faculty that are comfortable in this, we want them to understand the, the methodology behind it and then understand sort of the theory and, and understand how to do this properly. Um, along with that, standardized patients, sometimes it's not even about how. Uh, sometimes we actually take the mannequin off the bed and we have a live person in the bed. Trust me, they still don't get hurt. Um, but in that way, what we use is a, a live actor. And so we're working through how can we make a robust pipeline of actors who can help our students uh, to engage in this learning environment and, and have enough people to do that. And then finally, it comes down to research. Uh, if we can show that we can improve our simulations, can we improve the outcomes for patients? Because we have a learner who goes into that area ready to perform at the top of their scope and they understand it and they can communicate with each other to make it safer for that patient. So downstream effects, we'd love to be able to research the educational outcomes, but then also how do we get to that, uh, the holy grail of, of safer healthcare? And the space that you're seeing right now is our beautiful space here at the Ernest Mario School of Pharmacy, which is essentially the hub of this big collaborative that we have with all of these spokes going out. So you're just seeing two of us. Really, there's two of us here. Less is mainly for uh, MSOP and I'm mainly for the medical school. We have colleagues at the other schools. We have colleagues at the PA school, at the School of Health Related Professions, at the nursing school. Um, in order to make this dream a reality, we need support um, in the form of essentially like a department yeah. that has, uh, you know, dedicated team members whose job it is to maintain this space and to help educate the faculty so that the technology isn't scary, so that they feel comfortable using it, um, to make sure that we have time to invest in the research and like going through proposals and making sure that these things are at the core of what we want to pursue. Um, that takes that takes people, but what it takes, what does it take less? It takes space, staff, and stuff. It's the three things of simulation. So those are the things that we're hoping for in the future. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Les and Colleen. This was truly a very impressive interactive uh, webinar tonight. I look forward to learning more about the Simulation Center and everything going on at Rutgers. Thank you all for being here with us tonight. We hope that you've enjoyed. Go ahead, Colleen, did you have something no, else? We do have one, one last little thing. Um, if you liked this, this is just the appetizer, right? <laughs> this is just like a little show of what we can do. We are hoping in the relatively near future to host some in-person tours. Uh, so you could come to the space and try on the headset. You could listen to Hal or Robert with the stethoscope. You could come and actually feel what it's like to participate in this space. So please, if you enjoyed this stuff today, please keep an eye out for any future stuff coming down. We're really hoping to do something maybe later in the spring. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Everybody, thank you again for attending, and we look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully in the spring. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you all. Good night, good night. Bye, good night. Bye-bye.